screen here. Yeah. Okay, are you guys on the right screen now? Okay. I've never screen shared before, so, okay. So, hi, um, it's nice to be back. I, sorry, I took a bit of a hiatus uh, from the club. I've since moved out to Guelph and I was commuting back to Toronto like five hours a day. It's not fun, don't recommend it. Don't ever do that. So, but I have a local job now, so I'm back. Um, so I thought I'd resurrect this style. I'm trying to get my BJCP certification. So um, my goal is to have like a whole bunch of styles that are on the uh, on our club um, website so that if you're like looking to put your beer into a competition or if you're looking to um, submit your beer um, to, to study for BJCP yourself, you can kind of go there and you can refer to what the BJCP categories are um, with specific context of um, like what's available in Ontario. So hopefully it'll help you out a little bit with there. Um, so this week um, we're doing um, everything that's like fruits and vegetables because um, that lumps together quite nicely. And then next, um, I don't know if these are gonna go in that exact order. Um, so the next couple of months that I do, we're gonna do Belgian and French and then lagers and then porters and stouts. Um, so um, when you're talking about fruit beers and vegetable beers and everything, you really want to go with the culinary definition. So if you put tomato in a beer, it's not a fruit beer. I don't care what the botanists say. Um, if you have to go, oh, well, technically it's this, that's not the category that you want to enter your beer in. Um, so all of category 29 is anything that's fruited basically, um, except for the wild beers, those go into like American wild ale. Um, so generally you're just working off of a base style, which you'll declare. So the fruit beer, you wanna have a balance between the fruit and the base style, um, but it's still recognizable as the base style. So if it's a, a raspberry goza, you can taste the raspberry, you can taste the goza. It's not like a sour raspberry juice thing. Um, and so fruit and spice is just the variation with the extra little bit of spices. Um, and then specialty fruit is a category that has like a little bit of something extra. Um, it could be an alternative process or an alternative fermentable. So if you made it like a gluten-free fruit beer that would go here, or if you made a fruit beer that has honey or molasses or maple, um, that would also go in that category. Um, but when we're talking about fruit beers for Bruce Slam and, and competitions that our club runs, there's also two provisional styles that we include in this category. Um, the first one, I have never had a beer uh, from this style. If you have, I'd love to hear about it because it sounds really intriguing. Um, so the provisional style three is an Italian grape ale and it's basically a union between a beer and a wine. And so it originated in Italy um, because the craft brewers there were trying to highlight the, the unique grape varietals. And so the unique thing here is that you can actually taste like the specific variety of the grape in it. So you can taste those you know, notes of leather or notes of chocolate. And it's actually coming from the grape. And you can have up to 40% of the bill is grape. So there's a lot of room for experimentation. Um, the second provisional fruit style is a Caterina Sour. Um, if you were at Bruce Lab a couple of years ago, you might have had the um, pleasure of tasting one of these. Uh, People's Pint made one for all of our volunteers uh, with uh, dragon fruit, I believe, and it was phenomenal. Um, so this one originates in Brazil, and again, it's just a local, um, it's a local style that started originating because people wanted to highlight the uh, local ingredients, and they wanted to make something that was more suitable to the tropical weather. So. In style, it's very similar to a Berliner Weiss, but it's stronger um, and it typically has like a tropical fruit in it. So if you wanted to find some of these styles here, um, I've got a little bit of a list. The one on the right, um, the People's Pint and Society of Beer Drinking Ladies Tropic Like It's Hot. That one's not currently available that I know of, but I know People's Pint tends to bring things back around quite often. So that's why I've included it here. Uh, the other ones should all be available either like at the brewery itself or at the LCBO. Mm. Um, and so the next is just spiced beer. So that's everything under categories 30. That's often known as FHV, spice or veg, 
And again, you're using the culinary definition of spices, herbs, and vegetables. So this is where tomatoes go. If you wanted to be like Jesse Reynolds a couple of years ago for his cast days, when he made like a Caesar beer, that's where this would go. Um, I wouldn't recommend it though. It didn't look very good. Um, I'm sure it tasted fine. Uh, so this is where coconuts, coffee, vanilla, all of that kind of stuff goes. Um, and there's also the two other categories in there, autumn seasonable and win winter seasonal. Um, and again, you're just working off of the base style. So if you wanted to uh, make a spice herb and vegetable porter or spice herb and vegetable uh, amber ale or American pale ale or something, you still need to be able to discern the base style underneath it instead of just covering it up. Um, so we don't technically have any fruit beer examples in the recipe database. Um, we, there's kind of one with Andrew McCready's got his uh, what goes round. There's a, a raspberry version within the, res within the recipe, um, but there are two, two or three specific spice herb, spice herb vegetable category beers. Um, so Clayton's got his coconut brown because coconut is a nut. It doesn't go in the fruit category, it goes in the nut category. Um, and then there's the two winter seasonal ales um, by Keith Keynes and David Green. And um, these ones, they tend to be pretty seasonal. Um, of course, in the name, autumn seasonal and winter seasonal. But there are a couple of uh, ones that are available year round. Um, like the Licking Hole Creek one um, has jalapenos, or sorry, chilies, I think, in it. Um, and so that's considered a vegetable under the culinary um, term. And then Rorschach and Henderson have these other two out now, which is like the uh, chocolate milk coffee vanilla stout. And then the Henderson Society Beer Drinking Ladies, again, has the hibiscus pill ill. So yeah, that's pretty much it for the styles. Um, next time, I was going to go through Belgian and French beers. Um, this is a gigantic category in Beer Slam, and there's a ton of really cool stuff in there. So we do have a ton of things in the recipe database as well. If you wanted to give one of these styles a go, um, notably, Mike Van has his um, NHC winning Saison recipe that's phenomenal. So if you have never tried that, I would highly recommend it. Um, and Mark Rarick, of course, the Catalyst Brewing, he's got his Saison as well. So that's also a very award-winning beer. Um, that's pretty much all I have for the styles. So I guess I'll send it back to you, David. Thank or unless you. anybody has any questions. I was just about to say that. Like, does anybody have any questions for Emily? I have a quick one. Um, on vegetable beers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was a time decades ago when people were, the home brewing thing was lighting up, but also the craft brewing were, you know, the use of pumpkin as a fermentable came back somewhat from history. Uh, and at some point it just switched from anything with pumpkin as a fermentable also had to have that disgusting pumpkin by flavor. Is it actually considered proper to make a pumpkin beer without all those spices in it? Uh, yeah, you can't. It's anything that evokes, like, okay. if you're going to make, I guess, technically pumpkin could be autumn seasonal or winter seasonal, but it's anything that, uh, like, evokes the season. So you're, you're just aiming to match the flavors of, like, um, so, so it could be, like, Thanksgiving dinner thing. that you're going okay. for. Um, so if, it I doesn't a pumpkin, if I made a pumpkin wheat right now, just using it as a fermentable, that wouldn't really play into the style properly. I'm not sure. Like, it's the categories are so broad and they're open to a lot of interpretation. So you could probably justify it, um, but that's what like the judge is going to be looking for when they're when they're um, assigning scores to your beer. It's like, does it really evoke like the feelings of autumn and or winter? Hmm. So, so if you can justify it, then go for it. Like a couple of years ago at Bruce Land, we had the key lime pie beer that won overall, and it's like if you can justify that this is. Um, what you're making, then anything is possible, totally. Thanks. Any other questions for Emily on this month's style of the month? Yeah, next next month is going to be like huge. We'll have to try and yeah. allocate appropriate amount of time for that, right? So it doesn't have to be next month. Like I'm going to be starting a new job in the next couple of weeks. So. <laughs> okay. 
All right. I think uh, if there's no other questions, uh, maybe what we can do. Where's my camera? Why is my camera not on? It's so stupid. Sometimes I get there. It is. Sometimes I get messed up. There we go. Uh, maybe what I could do is uh, David Larock. Are you? You're still on. So maybe I what I maybe what I could do is I pass it over to you for some announcements before we let uh, Nina uh, uh, run run wild on. Uh, with uh, from Imperial East. So uh, David, over to you. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so a few announcements. It's, it's been a pretty busy month since uh, we got together in May. Um, you know, looking back, obviously the big one was the hot buy, which was this past weekend. So since we last spoke, we launched the hot buy, closed it. I put on my hat of being a part-time hop dealer on the, on the GTA Brews uh, Facebook page to try and close as many hops as we could. Uh, and then, uh, you know, got the orders in and did the whole split on Saturday and the pickup on Sunday. Uh, so overall, that went pretty smoothly. Uh, I really want to thank all of our volunteers uh, who were able to pick up the big bags of hops and bring them home and split them on Saturday and bring them back to People's Pint on Sunday uh, so that we could dish them out to all, uh, all of our uh, members who ordered. Um, obviously, a, a big thank you as well to the leadership team, Eric, Bear, David, uh, Jim, and Mark, who kind of manage the actual hot buy pickup uh, yesterday. So thanks guys, it was, a, it was a long day, but overall it went pretty well. Um, at the end of the day, we did have a few extra hops sitting around that we weren't expecting. So if, if anyone you know goes through their order and notices that they either have the wrong hop or a missing one, uh, just send us an email at hotbuy at gtabrews.ca and uh, maybe we have what you're missing uh, sitting in Dave Chang Sang's freezer. <laughs> Uh, but overall, it was great. Um, in terms of bulk buys, um, we did not run a uh, spring grain buy just because of all the COVID restrictions. And we've decided not to run one, you know, a summer buy. What we're going to do is we're just going to hold the next grain buy until September or October so that hopefully, um, you know, this we've kind of gone through the last round of uh, COVID related uh, um I don't know what's the word to look for, uh, closures, so that we're back to our regular scheduled programming with one fall grain buy kind of sometime in uh, September or October, and then the spring grain buy would be sometime in April or May, something like that. So you can expect, uh, you know, the next bulk buy to be related to uh, the grain sometime in September. Um, uh, sorry, just one last thing on the hot buy. Um, the bowl uh, products and the bouncer products are still not in. So hopefully we get those in sometimes in the next few weeks and we can get those over to our members as soon as possible. Um, another big thing this month was it was uh, National Homebrew Day. So I know there are a number of people here on the meeting that were able to join us. Uh, so a big thanks to Eric and David for uh, running the hosting. I guess I was partial host also for the first little bit before my uh, my day went off the rails with kids. But uh, I, for one, I brewed the uh, one of the official CHA recipes, the Tropical Stout that Victor North did. It overall went really well. Dave, I know you also did the Tropical Stout. I haven't tasted mine yet. You said yours is tasting pretty good or pretty good, right? Although it did, did it drop? Yeah, a, a, it, did it drop it, a bit more? No, it didn't drop anymore. So it's sitting at ten twenty and. Um, I think I'm blaming this on the fact that I pitched, I should have pitched at a lager rate, knowing that it's a, it's a, it's a lager yeast. And uh, I guess I just, I figured, oh, well, it's an ale. I'll just pitch at an ale rate. Right. So I, I, I I'm, that's what I'm saying right now. We'll see. Who knows? It's, but it's sitting at 1020. So I'm just going to leave it there. It tastes really good though. That's the thing. It's like, it's, it's, uh, I don't know if I really want it to go any further. I'm happy with the way it tastes right now. So we'll see. Hey, Eric, how's uh, how's yours chugging along? I haven't checked it in a few days, but uh, I pitched it and it's been there ever since. It hasn't walked away. So that's about <laughs> as much as I know. <laughs> uh, is there anyone else on the call that brewed on uh, June 5th that uh, wants to share what they brewed and how it's going? I want to hear about John's, or Luke's pickles. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Luke, he's Luke spent, he's the whole meeting's worth of time making pickles. I don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they turned out fine. They were pickles are pretty good. Put them in the fridge yesterday. Are they spicy? Because I remember you were you not adding uh, some uh, some peppers to to the pickles. Yeah, one of them has a few um, dried chilies in there. It's not not super spicy, but yeah. 
mostly just standard dill pickles. Nice. And Colin brewed a. Did Colin's party gal turn out? I, I, I think oh, by the yeah. time we hung up, he was still starting the I, second one. I haven't talked to him. I saw him today briefly because he dropped off some beer for me, but <clears throat> pardon me, but uh, I haven't I haven't asked him about about that because he's if I say what you know how's that beer fermenting he's going to say which one right so <laughs> I, don't, I really don't know I should ask him you know, and, and touch base to find out I wonder what he's going to brew with his wheelbarrow full of hops that he got through the hop by yeah he has <laughs> so many I think his whole evening tonight is he's spending vacuum sealing that's, <laughs> that's that's the excitement he's doing so Um, great. So uh, one of the other big announcements that uh, we sent out in the newsletter yesterday is uh, the club's currently working on a summer showdown competition. I know a lot of people here are probably eager to, to get those pandemic recipes that they've been working on and for the past, I don't know, what, 16 months, wherever long it's been, mm -hmm. uh, ready to get them ready for the big show. So uh, you know, we hope to have some details to share regarding uh, a competition uh, that's going to be held late August. Uh, so that's when the entry deadline would be. So those are going to be coming hopefully in the next month or so. Um, just because I did get a question about this today, uh, we're not doing the summer showdown in lieu of Bruce Lamb. Uh, the way that we're sort of thinking about it right now is uh, if we are in a position come fall that uh, we still can't get, you know, let's say a whole bunch of judges together in one place to do something uh, the scale of Bruce Lamb. Uh, we want to at least have one kind of virtual judging type competition under our belt before we do a bigger one like Bruce Lamb. Uh, so really this is kind of, this is almost like the spring showdown, but done in the summer. Uh, that will hopefully give us some uh, experience and uh, you know, just a bit more uh, hands-on um, understanding about what running a, uh, a competition would be like if we have to do the judging mm -hmm. virtually. So you know, try to understand what the logistics are like, how many people we need to be driving around, how many extra bottles we might need beyond the, the usual two or three. Uh, that type of thing. So the, the plan is, you know, Bruce Lamb's still up in the air, but we hope that this one kind of uh, gets us ready to uh, to go into Bruce Lamb pretty quickly come fall. Um, and lastly, um, I did have a chat with our uh, barrel directors uh, earlier uh, today. And uh, for those that do have a beer in the barrel that's at People's Pint, uh, we do hope to be sending out a date for emptying that barrel. Uh, for some time in July. So um, you can expect that beer to come out of that barrel sometime next month. So we're going to send uh, an email around hopefully sometime soon with some more details about how, uh, you know, what the process will be for getting that beer out of that barrel. Apparently it's tasting good. I haven't tasted it, but I trust Evan and David Green that it's tasting good. Um, those are the big, sorry. I was going to say, are we calling end of life for that barrel or are we going to refill That's it? That barrel is end of life. Uh, that's what you know, David and um, uh, Evan have said. Uh, there's not really much more to get out of it. We have unfortunately not been able to track down like a freshly emptied wine barrel. That's what David and Evan are looking for um, to sort of fill it again right away. If anyone does have any contacts like in the wine industry, uh, please send me an email. Uh, because I think really what the guys are looking for is to get a wine barrel that's been emptied like that week or even a few days before and then immediately getting it over to people's pints so that we can fill it again with a new beer. Um, they're having some trouble uh, finding a barrel that or, or like you know a company that um, um, yeah we have we have talked to Doomering um, and it sounds like all of his barrels are already used um, and they don't, they're not really like those freshly emptied uh, wine barrels. So I don't know, maybe these uh, barrel directors are a bit too specific about what they're looking for. But um, <laughs> so, so, we're, so right now the goal is just to get the beer out and, uh, you know, details about filling a new barrel with a new recipe. That might be something that, that, that comes down later. Um, but right now I think the focus is, just, you know, that's, that beer has been in that barrel for what, almost two years now. So let's get it out. Let's get people enjoying it. And then you know, hopefully we can find a new barrel to, uh, to fill. It'll be two years and two months in July. Yeah. So yeah, we gotta get that beer. it's time to get that beer out. <laughs> if there's any beer left. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so those only kind of announcements and recap stuff I had, uh, are there any questions uh, either about what I talked about or generally about the club that uh, anyone has?
I'll take that as a no. Um, as always, if there's any questions, don't hesitate to uh, send me an email, uh, david.laroc at gtabrews.ca or president at gtabrews.ca. I think that's coming to me now, Eric. Um, has been since, since uh, February. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah, if there are any questions that come up, don't hesitate to write me or really anyone from the leadership team. Uh, anyone would be happy to uh, field your questions and uh, get back to you. Do, does do any of the fellow directors have anything to add or? Everyone good? Yeah, all I guess good. Just with, just with the competition, yeah, like you said, it, we're, we're, this one's all virtual, uh, except for the BOS. So um, if, if you're a judge and you're interested in helping out, um, the beers will either be coming to you or you'll pick them up. Um, and we'll be heavily relying on people coming back out to help us judge this thing kind of thing, because we're planning over 100 entries. So we need to be able to get it judged. Great. Uh, and sorry, I don't think I'll be able to stay for the entire meeting, but Nina, I really wanted to thank you for taking the time and joining our club and talking about talking to us about all things Imperial East. I've used Imperial a number of times and it's been, uh, it's really awesome. You So uh, I'm really excited to, to hear what you have to, to say and share with our members. So thanks again for taking the time. Cool. All right. Great. Thanks, Dave. So uh, good segue too. I think we're going to lead right into you, Nina. So uh, the floor is yours, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's Nina Houts from Imperial Yeast in Philadelphia. Awesome. Thank you so much also for having me here to join the club. It's been such a great way over the past 16 months, I guess we've determined, um, just to connect with folks all over and have a great excuse to drink a beer on a work night for me. So I'm okay with it. Um, and it was really nice getting to hear what's going on with the club on your end and um, Emily's presentation too on the style of the month. I'm feeling so validated in my choice of beer right now, which was actually Berliner Weiss with hibiscus and raspberry. So it fit right in and I didn't even know. It was just perfect timing. So what I will do now is I'm going to share my screen. And while I get that pulled up, I will just um, give a couple of housekeeping items. It seems like you're all very well versed in the world of Zoom meetings. So I do just ask that I, while I run these very casually, um, if you've got any questions at any point, feel free to uh, unmute yourself or drop things in the chat box and I'll be able to get to things as they pop up. But yeah, feel free to ask questions whatever we don't get to during the presentation, I will leave plenty of time for at the end and we can get as many of your questions and curiosities about yeast covered as we can this evening. So I'm gonna jump into it. And it sounds like a good number of you are familiar with Imperial Yeast, but for those of you who are not as familiar, we are a liquid yeast company that has been around since 2014. And our mission has always been to provide very high quality liquid brewing yeast at proper pitch rates for brewers of all scales. So home brewers on through commercial brewers. We started as a yeast lab back in Portland, Oregon in 2014. And since then we have grown now to uh, two locations. So I personally started at Imperial in Portland. I work in sales and customer service, and I moved out to Philadelphia in October to help open the second location. And update-wise, I'll be able to share some photos of things that we've been working on along the way, but it's been a really exciting time. We've been able to grow into our new facility. We're growing yeast. We're getting things sent out to commercial brewers from this location, and we're working on getting things into homebrew pouches out here as well. So the way that I am going to model this presentation is kind of in two parts. So the first part is based on in pre-COVID times, and I imagine coming up soon as things open up a little bit more. We've always really enjoyed being able to offer our facilities as an open lab. So if you ever find yourself in Portland or Philadelphia, and you have some time where you want to come check out a yeast facility, we're always happy to show you around. 
And in this presentation, I'll give you kind of the, uh, the virtual version of that. I've got some photos, you'll still have to use your imagination, but I'll give you the rundown on what we're doing at Imperial to grow our yeast. And then we'll wrap up with some talk about homebrew level quality control and best practices. So if you were with me at the Portland facility, the very first place that I would be taking you to show you around is our laboratory. And in the lab is where everything in yeast propagation really starts and ends. So that means on site, we have a negative 80 degrees Celsius freezer that stores all of our mother cultures. And last we had checked, we were sitting well over 200 strains in the bank. So we have quite a few. Naturally, we're not propagating all of those strains all of the time. We are focused on propagating the the 30 of our core strains that you'll typically find in homebrew pouches. But we'll also be doing some special propagations or one-offs, if you will, for commercial breweries that might want a special strain for their brewery. Um, some folks bank their private strains with us and we'll grow them up for them. So we've got a lot of different props going on at the same time. But the way it works is we only need to go into that negative 80 Celsius freezer a couple times a year at most, because what we're trying to do is just take a very small, small, small sterile loop of cells from our mother culture to get us started onto a little uh, working slant. So we'll be able to use a working slant depending on the strain for a number of months up to a whole year. And really from there, we're just starting a series of very small propagation. So we've got our working slants into start tubes. And what we're trying to get up to is into the flasks that you see in the right hand of the screen. And once we've made it up to flask inoculation is when we're ready to head into the, the big boy propagation. So production level props. Now, if you have ever been in a commercial brewery before, which I'm sure most of you have had that experience, our facilities look a lot like breweries. We've got the stainless steel conical fermenters, we've got hoses, our brew stand, our hot liquor tank. Um, the primary difference between what we're doing and what the standard brewery is doing is we still are making sort of a beer, I guess you could call it, but it's a really boring beer. We're not using any sort of hops. We're not using any specialty grains. We're really just making a very basic wort or media that will help facilitate the growth of our yeast. So since we don't handle any sort of grain in-house, that would be like the grain out process could be a potential source of cross-contamination or infection. We're exclusively using organic DME, organic sugar, and organic yeast nutrient to make up our media to grow the yeast. So this photo was actually taken hmm, probably like a year and a half ago at our production facility. And it's probably the last time that you were even able to take photos in there that would actually show the layout because since then we've filled in all of that empty space on the floor with even more tanks. So it's gotten a little bit cozy at that particular facility. But when the Portland facility first started, we were on a five barrel system and we have since graduated to a 27 barrel system. We've got one in Portland. We also have a 27 barrel system in uh, Philadelphia. So the tanks that we're working with are typically, uh, we'll work with four barrel, 10 barrel, 20s and 30s generally at a time. And on a standard brew day, like let's say that we were going to be growing a 30 barrel tank of A38 juice, one of our really popular strains that people like to use for hazy IPAs, it would kind of go like this. So 
our production crew would be pulling together that media. And in the left corner of the screen, you can see what functions as our kettle. It's not like a traditional open top boiling kettle. It functions a lot more like a pressure cooker, a really big pressure cooker. So we're bringing in our sugar, our DME and our yeast nutrient. We're bringing in some really filtered water and we're bringing all of that up to about 240 degrees Fahrenheit and about 10 PSI. So what we end up with is a really sterile wort that we are able to go around and feed our tanks according to their schedule. So for this prop of A38 juice in the 30 barrel tank that I mentioned, we would be typically starting by bringing in those flasks that the lab had prepared for us to inoculate. And on day one, we would just be adding just a little bit of media to get it kicked off. On day two, we would be adding a little bit more media to that same tank. And on day three, we would typically be adding a lot more media to bring us up to our final volume. Now, all the while we are consistently running oxygen, which you can see it's, it's filtered air that we run down. You can see the blue hoses that are dropping down to each tank. And those are all hooked up to individual regulators. So every tank has its own constant source of air. We're also holding all of our tanks right around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's regardless of what strain we're growing. It, goes the same for ales and for lagers. And that's because, like I mentioned, we're not trying to produce any sort of beer that tastes good. We're not really concerned about off flavors. We're just providing an environment that's going to be most conducive for cell growth. And that's at the warmer temperatures. So once we have added our, our three days worth of media additions, we're really just letting it ride out to terminal gravity. Um, once we've hit our terminal gravity, just like you would with beer, we're going to cut off our air and we are going to cold crash that tank. So we've got glycol jackets that will help drop that tank's temperature down to help all of that yeast fall out of solution. More tanks. So Obviously a very important part of growing the yeast is being able to get it out of tank so we can then package it for people. And I'm sure as most of you being home brewers who have worked with a lot of different strains, I'm sure that you can attest to the concept that depending on the strains that you're working with, you can have a really different experience when it comes to handling them. So, Maybe you've had some strains that are very small celled, have a very nice, even consistent slurry to work with. Other times you might have some strains that are a little feistier. They might like to try to climb out of your fermenter. They might stick to the walls. They might float at the top. We encounter a lot of those same flocculation attributes um, as you do, and it's just on a larger scale. So depending on the strain that we're trying to harvest from tank, it can take between one and three days to get like a full complete harvest from a tank. For our bigger tanks, we're usually going into a secondary um, mixed tank to homogenize our slurry really well. And then for our smaller tanks, we're typically hand harvesting where we're going to pull the yeast off of the bottom very slowly and consistently into plastic carboys. And those will go off into the lab for final blending and counting. And sadly, well, I don't think it's sadly, but some people think it's sad that our, our weak beer, that's our bright byproduct does, does go down the drain. I assure you it does not taste good. It's not something that you necessarily want to hold on to. So you don't have to be too sad about it. Oh, here's a little peek of Philadelphia production before we were totally online. I just like this photo because it's got the very status. If anybody likes to peel that protective layer off of equipment, this was like the, it was like Disneyland. We got to do that all day. It wasn't really fun after like the third hour of doing it, but um, there's, a, there's now even more tanks fit back into that space 
while we make room for, for more. I have a question for you about your propaganda yeah. work. Um, yes. It's always confused me a little bit. Perhaps I should read up more on this, but even with starters, um, it's always seemed to be recommended to have a, a wart that's basically very low, pretty very low gravity, essentially, or yep. relatively low gravity. I've never understood why that is specifically an issue. And uh, you obviously are doing that commercially too. So uh, is that something you'd explain without us taking up the whole night? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the very simple answer was, so our, ours is like nine Play-Doh. I'm sorry, I've learned all of my my numbers in Plato, it's not easy for me to switch to specific gravity in my head, but um, nine Plato, pretty, pretty much on the low side. And it's just a very simple, easy, easy wort that's going to be just easy for the yeast to get to work on. They don't really have to do a whole lot of heavy lifting. And then it's also not going to produce a whole lot of alcohol. So the more alcohol that's produced, um, that can create some changes in pH that can end up impacting your viability. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we're trying to avoid um, that drop in pH. So we actually do some pH adjustments to make sure that our, our yeast slurry comes up lean in a little bit more basic. We'll do some pH adjustments um, just because that's going to be more ideal for yeast viability. Does that help? Yeah, I, I, I didn't think of that, uh, some of those other factors. So I just, mm -hmm. that does help. I had a question as well. Do you also add a little bit of hops in there as well or not? We do not use any, any oh. hops. Yeah. Oh. Um, I think kind of, I think in the context that we've been asked that before, it's hops have traditionally been used in kind of like an antimicrobial setting, but we don't have to worry about that in a lab setting. Like our wort is being brought up to 240 degrees Fahrenheit and 10 PSI. So we're killing off any sort of potential contamination. And at any rate, I think adding, adding hops, um, for one, you don't want that in contact with your yeast that yeah. can, is not as healthy for it. And yeah, we're, we're not working with any hops. Cause when I used to do a starter, I, I've been doing it with no hot, with no hops in it. Mm -hmm. And I've been told <laughs> just to put one pellet in there. I, I don't know what for just one little bit for it. Good to luck. Okay. All right. That's fine. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So back to the laboratory. As I promised, this is kind of where everything in our propagation cycle starts and ends. So this was taken at our uh, Portland facility. And there's a lot of shiny equipment that the lab folks are very, very proud of. If there are any other lab nerds in here, I'm sure you'll appreciate seeing this photo. Um, but the lab is, is uh, their role is to make sure that before any of the yeast leaves the building, everything gets properly blended and counted and controlled for quality and making sure that we don't have any contamination issues. So primary role of the lab is going to be counting our slurry to ensure that we're at our spec cell counts. And what we're going for with our spec slurry density is 1.29 billion cells per milliliter or gram of slurry. So quite a few cells. And as glamorous as it is to think that our lab folks might be hunched over microscopes all day long, that would actually be very labor intensive with the number of cell counts that they need to be performing. So we do have some technology to help them out. And on the screen is a screen grab of our Nexalom salometer. And the way that this works is that they're able to take a small sample of the slurry, dilute it out, and add some dye. And then when they put the slide into this machine, um, it's able to show up where you're fluorescing your live cells versus dead cells. So we're able to get a pretty accurate count, just the computer is able to do a lot of that counting for us. So we don't have to sit there going like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, and it will also give us a good indicator of what viability is looking like. We're obviously looking for very strong viability on all of our strains in order to permit it to leave the house. So quality control 
is the next major step of our, our lab crew. And basically what we're most concerned about when it comes to QC is we're a facility that works with a lot of different microorganisms. So not only are we handling Saccharomyces strains, we're also growing Britannomyces and Lactobacillus. And it's just very important that we don't have, for example, our Britannomyces in our Saccharomyces. And I guess I would say like, it's a little misleading to save this, the QC, QC saying that it's all performed in the lab at the end. We have a lot of other procedures in place to ensure that we don't have cross-contamination at any other point in our propagation process, but QC is just to check and make sure that everything went according to plan, and this is kind of our last checkpoint that we're able to use before we send anything out. So primarily what we're working with is differential media plating techniques where we're able to make sure that we don't have any other common beer spoilers in certain samples and that certain organisms aren't growing where they shouldn't be. And the way that works simply is that we have different medias on different plates that can be held in different environments, such as an anaerobic or aerobic environment. And uh, the nutrient and environment can either inhibit or promote certain types of growth. So we're able to look pretty easily just glancing at certain plates. Um, we're looking just to make sure that the colonies that we're expected to see for certain strains are showing up normally and that we don't see any other types of cells on those plates. We're also doing a little bit of genetic um, testing via PCR just to ensure that we don't have cross-contamination between um, variants of Saccharomyces that are considered STA1 or diastaticus. Those particular variants of Saccharomyces are prone to uh, leading to over attenuation in certain circumstances. So while we do have some strains that are known diastaticus strains, it's very important that we test to ensure that our standard strains that don't have it aren't infected. So it's an important important part of that process. So once everything is cleared by our QC crew, it's time for that yeast to go to its final destination. And if we were going to be sending it off to a commercial brewery, our typical recommendation for brewers is to pitch one liter of yeast per barrel of standard gravity wort. So a brewery could be ordering anywhere between one liter and hundreds of liters of yeast from us at a time. And everything else that we have set aside goes to pouching, which is really a solid one man job. You can see Sean here, he's pulling those carboys that all in all those will probably each come out to about 45 pouches worth of yeast. So he's responsible for making sure that exactly 155 mils of yeast slurry is pumped into each bag. Each bag gets sealed, it gets stamped with a born on date and then goes directly into cold storage. All right, and this is the point where everyone needs to take a sip of beer because that's the only way we can really talk about numbers. I know I'm going to. So numbers, as I mentioned, if you remember a couple slides back, our slurry density of our, the actual slurry that we're pulling out of the tank, we're shooting for 1.29 billion viable cells per mil. So if we're putting 155 mils of that slurry into a pack, that's 200 billion cells. And then when you pitch, that one pouch, the 200 billion cells per pack into your five gallons, that's what yields your pitch rate, which is in this case, using one pouch into five gallons is 10 and a half million cells per mil. Now, if you've ever had the pleasure of talking to anyone from Imperial, uh, we will always, always say how important pitch rate is when it comes to producing great beer. 
And this pitch rate in particular, the 10 and a half million cells per mil is a brewing publication backed. It's like an industry standard acceptable for um, being associated with short lead times, quick, healthy fermentations, and overall reducing chances of off flavors in your beer that could be attributed to any sort of yeast stress or under attenuation. So pitch rate, super, super important. We try to make it easy for you to pitch enough by putting 200 billion cells in each pouch. So since we have gone through so much trouble to produce some really healthy yeast for you, there are some things that you can be doing from your end to ensure that you have the healthiest yeast possible. First of all, the shelf life of our yeast is four months from the printed manufacture date on the pouch. I think it's always important to know what your supplier recommends and why they recommend it. We recommend using within four months in particular because we had conducted long-term viability studies of all of our strain families over the course of a year. And we found that when held at consistent conditions, so being stored cold consistently, um, we didn't notice any sort of significant viability decline at that four, four month mark for any strain family. So everything was consistently at at least 90% viability and above. It's only after that four month mark that things kind of went all over the place, depending on the strain. Some are a little, bit more hardy than other strains. And it's really hard to know exactly what's in your pouch. So we err on the side of caution and we give that four months for the manufacture date. But beyond that, there are still plenty of viable cells in the pouch. You can just assume that you are starting to lose some after that mark. Um, but that leads into the storing cold and pitching cold recommendation. So Keep your yeast cold up until the time that you're ready to pitch. It's not necessary to take your yeast out ahead of time to, um, I know some people will bring it up to room temperature before pitching. It's not a necessary step just because when yeast is stored cold, it's in like a, it's in like an inactive phase. So it's not going to be wanting to actively be consuming sugars or doing any off gassing. And as soon as it starts warming up, if that's within your pouch, that's like an enclosed space, that off gassing can lead to some pressure within your pouch. And that pressure is not so great for your viability. So pitching directly from your fridge into fermentation temperature wort ensures that your yeast will become active in a very nutrient rich environment and it will be ready to get to work. Beyond that, it's pretty, pretty basic, just making sure that you're paying attention to your strain specific needs and considering making, making considerations to your pitch rate when it comes to batch size or gravity or particular temperatures or pHs. Now, I know that I said that you don't have to, maybe I didn't say it explicitly, but we design our pouches to pitch directly one pouch into five gallons, no need to build a starter for a standard gravity beer. There are some circumstances where we do recommend building a starter, such as if you're going to be brewing a bigger beer, so something that's over 1070 or 17 Play-Doh, if you're brewing a bigger batch, so something over five gallons, maybe you have an older pouch or maybe one that had been subjected to some temperature fluctuations, either too warm, so now it's swollen or frozen and then thawed. And I, I usually assume most people have made a starter at some point. So my takeaway with this slide is just to recommend that if you are going to be building a starter with a pouch of imperial yeast, we don't recommend building a starter smaller than two liters. And this is because we want to ensure that there's going to be enough nutrients for all of those cells to be go, go through their full replication cycle. 
All right, almost to the end. This is like my little bonus slide here. I'm wondering how many folks do any sort of harvesting and repitching, just out of curiosity. A couple people, or maybe, yep. Okay. Yes. I've done this. I've done this uh, presentation for Thanks. my boss or one of my owners before. And he's like, why are you telling people to harvest and repitch? We're a yeast lab and people should buy a new pouch every time. <laughs> so this is me being rebellious, but I really think that harvesting and repitching is a really great way to get to know your yeast. Um, and it's pretty, pretty simple to perform and it can be really rewarding to really get to know that when you're caring for your strain properly, then you can get really good results out of it for multiple generations. So um, it's pretty simple where you just wanna keep things as clean as possible and you don't really wanna be sitting on harvested slurry for very long. So timing is a really important component to this. Um, you don't wanna be harvesting and storing your yeast that's just been sitting at room temperature on finished beer for weeks on end. Really the ideal time to harvest is going to be as soon as you've hit terminal gravity and as soon as you've completed your diacetyl rest, you're good to pull that off and get it cold as soon as possible. If you want to do like a, a slurry rinse, um, you can boil and cool some water. You can pour that in with your slurry in a sanitized and enclosed mason jar, for example. You can shake it up and let everything fall out into like stratified layers. And you can pull off the true pretty, pretty easily that way. So refrigerate for not too long. Again, I don't have hard and fast rules on here. Some, some strains are going to hold up better than others. If you ever have question about something being stored for too long, you can always use it to build a starter again. But when you're ready to pitch, we recommend pitching by weight, not necessarily by, by volume. Weight is preferable because that doesn't, it won't weigh out. It's like with volume, you might get some, some gassiness or some fluffier yeast um, that can throw off your pitch. So you'll just want to go ahead and pitch by weight and 200 to 300 grams of slurry per five gallons is pretty excess, pretty appropriate. Okay, we've made it to the end and I can answer any burning questions that folks have. I had a question for you, actually. Um, temperature. You said uh, keep, keep cold and pitch cold. Now is that? Yes. Does that go only for home brewing or for industry as well? It's pretty common in industry as well. Um, lots of folks, I mean, I guess there, there's multiple ways that commercial breweries are hand, handling their, their yeast. Um, some people will pull into a brink or a keg and keep it cold up until they're ready to pitch again. Um, some people are just going to cone to cone. So at the end of fermentation, when it's time to be pulling off anyways, they're just sending that into the next tank. And that doesn't, that doesn't harm it in any way. What we're trying to avoid is having that yeast just sitting and hanging out at room temperature and not having access to any food. Because okay. actually, I, I, the way we do it is uh, we, once we take the yeast off the cake, we put it in a, in a pail. Mm -hmm. and it was in the cooler so next time mm -hmm. what i do is while i'm mashing i take out the yeast let it sort of warm up give it a stir but i find it gets mm -hmm. fluffy and stuff right mm -hmm. and then i'll mm -hmm. do my count and then i'm not sure if you get an accurate count of it because you get the fluffies and what have you so i stir it three or four times as i'm waiting for it to pitch is that correct if that's working out for you and you're taking if you're taking counts that's going to be the best indicator of of what's going on so especially if you have an open if you've got something open and you're letting it warm up it's it's fine to have something out for a couple hours you're not going to be harming your viability in that amount of time necessarily right. um we are more concerned about building pressure in an enclosed okay. container so if you're using like a brink or a modified keg, that would be something that you would want to be off gassing as okay. well. But yeah, if that process is working, that's awesome. Okay, cool. Thank you.
Yeah. I, I got two questions and one of them might be a rabbit hole and maybe I'll ask them and you just choose to answer one of them. <laughs> because it might take all night for both of them. Let's do it. The, the first one is, um, and this is the rabbit hole one, which is, I mean, yeast characteristics and flavors and off flavors and so on, I mean, are all things we're learning about and finding out maybe sometimes the hard way, sometimes the great way. Um, but if there's anything that you um, could think about uh, for, from a homebrewer scale that would be helpful uh, knowledge to us, that would be cool. Uh, yeah. That question is just too much work. Uh, maybe have a fun one, which is in your position of uh, having this lab full of great critters. What are the most exciting yeasts and things that you think are coming up that we need to know about? We've never, never even thought about what it could do for us. Yeah. I will answer, I will answer both of those actually. So the first one, um, actually when I, when I do a follow-up email to you all, I will include some resources. I can throw my presentation on there. I'll throw like our yeast strain genetic equivalency chart. So you can compare uh, what our strains are genetically to some other suppliers. And I'll throw in a couple of some simple tests that can be performed at the homebrew scale. And one of them in particular is one of my favorites that I always recommend for commercial brewers as well. It's called a VDK force test, and it's a test for diacetyl. And I know diacetyl can be really pesky, especially for people who enjoy brewing lagers. Um, but we really, we really recommend this process for anything that you're brewing and it's pretty easy to perform where really you're just taking a sample of your finished beer. You're able to heat it up and cool it back down and perform sensory on it to look for that signature buttered, butter, buttery, slick popcorn aroma and flavor profile that's signature for diacetyl. So I think on the homebrew scale, there are a couple of tests that you can be doing to um, just learn more about your beer and where it's at and how it develops. So while I'm not going to go down a rabbit hole, I will send a couple of resources your way that are going to keep sensory and QC in mind, if that's useful. Uh, yeah, I think the only time I ever really chased a diacetyl, uh, the tail of that dragon is when I'm doing lagers and, and I just actually do diacetyl rests in my presentation mm -hmm. and it seems to work just fine. Yes, excellent. That's awesome. I think your other question was on all of the new and exciting things mm. from our yeast lab. And I always like this question that I do get kind of frequently is working for a yeast lab, people want to know like, okay, what's, what's new and exciting that we should know about? But what you don't know is that I actually need to be asking that question of you all. And we take our cues from particularly the homebrew world, because you guys are usually the ones who are a couple steps ahead and wanting to know what's, what's going to be the next big and exciting Brew. I mean, I can credit homebrewers for definitely the Kavik trend taking off over the last couple of years. It was largely a movement by a lot of homebrewers. And ultimately, the reason why we even have the Kavik strains that we do in our lineup. Um, but the cool thing about yeast is that it's unlike other ingredients in beer that are agricultural products. So when you think about hops or you think about malt, that takes years of planning and cultivation to finally hit the consumer. Whereas yeast is a really short pro process. Like we can hear about fun new strains and have those turned around in like a couple weeks time ultimately. Um, but I'm kind of digressing from your question there. But I think the things that are, are most fun to play around with, obviously the Kvike strains have been really neat to see what the range is for for a lot of those strains um something like our a43 loki which is our Voss strain that can ferment at pretty cool temperatures like mid 60s and produce really nice pseudo lager crispy zesty notes and then you ramp it up into the higher end of the range and it just pushes a bunch of super citrusy orange 
Esther profile, which is really, really cool. I think my boring answer side to that too is that I personally don't think that people experiment enough with using particular yeasts for a lot of different styles. And when I think of, for example, a strain like A38 juice that people typically reach for, for their hazy New England IPAs, I think it's often overlooked because it's actually just a really great versatile English strain. And I've had really amazing stouts and ESBs and porters made with A38 juice. So I do encourage people to just be kind of creative in how you're thinking about using strains and you don't necessarily have to like pick one strain for one style beer and then pick another strain for another style beer. You can, can kind of play around with what those parameters are. Right. I hope that helps. Um, when you guys sell your uh, yeast, or I, I haven't actually looked at your marketing material, do you, do you list uh, in some of those strains, well, maybe any of them? I mean, obviously temperature will coax out different things too. I mean, uh, um, are there, again, when you're taking a yeast that sort of everybody wants to buy for one reason, is there any clues to, hey, if I use it in this other way, I should work in different temperature ranges too? Yeah, so we're working in R&D to develop more of like a comprehensive booklet of things that you can be expecting at different ranges. But for the time being on all of our pouches and on our website, we do have that kind of information of temperature range. Um, we've got our stated general attenuation range, flocculation characteristics, and ABV range. But if you ever need suggestions for picking a strain for a certain style of beer, I'm always here. I'm happy to help. Cool. Uh, I think we had another, Ed, you had a question, right? Yeah, I just, when you were talking about the starter and you had recommended a, a two liter starter minimum, and here I am going, uh-oh, I've got two flasks. Both of them are two liter flasks. There's no way I'm making a two liter starter in a two liter flask. So I typically make, uh, if, if I need to make a starter um, for, a, for a bigger beer or whatever, I will typically do like a one liter starter. Is that really bad? Or is, is that just, you know, keep it going fast and, and don't let it sit too long because they're mm -hmm. going to stress the yeast out? I mean, I guess it's probably easier for you to answer that question as long as you're observing complete fermentations and no, no off flavors associated with the batch once you've pitched something. Um, I think that's going to ultimately give you the answer there. I don't think it's we we're recommending this in terms of, you know, best practice. And so we're going to recommend best practices being a full full pouch into two liters, but we all have to be scrappy as homebrewers and sometimes we got to use what's available to us and, and make that work. So if you're making that work and it's worked for you in the past, I always say, keep it, keep it going or right. just buy it, buy a bigger flask. Yep. Like if you give a mouse a cookie and he's going to need a bigger stir plate. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions for Nina? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. go ahead, Michael. Yeah, uh, it's not really a, a propagation or use question. It's more about delivery practice. Do you guys ever recommend certain practices to retailers? Because they, a lot of them say, oh, you got to put in uh, freezer packs with your, your yeast if you buy fresh yeast and have it delivered but they never say how many per, per pack or whatever. Yes. This would have put me off getting, getting yeah. fresh beef delivered. It's, a, it's an ongoing conversation is how I would describe it. And when we start working with retailers, we do give a really comprehensive, um, we try to give as much support as we can for 
keeping the yeast as healthy as possible. And from our perspective, obviously fresh yeast, yeast is healthiest yeast, cold yeast is the best yeast. If you're gonna be shipping something uh, loaded up in, with ice and ideally not shipping during summer, but we know that's just not a possibility all the time. So um, whenever possible, if you are kind of stuck ordering from online sources and have to have it shipped, I would definitely recommend getting it with ice and the shortest transit time possible whenever whenever you can request it. Um, if you ever have questions about the condition of the yeast that you receive from any supplier, feel free to reach out to us directly. Uh, we can always help advise based on if something arrives kind of warm or kind of puffy. We can typically take a look at it and let you know if it would be best to build a starter or double up on packs or in some cases send a new pack if if necessary so we're standing by to to help with that but yeah we we try our best to give all the info that we can to retailers and know that they're also trying their best i guess it's like getting a kidney delivered <laughs> yeah very similar i would say <laughs> Uh, we had a question from Cliff. Cliff, I think uh, you're right there. So, All right. Actually, it kind of dovetails a little bit on uh, Ed's question with the starter. Um, so the recommendation is to go to a two liter starter as is that kind of the final? So let's say if you had a friend who with like full intentions bought yeast that they were going to use it, left it in the fridge for let's say eight months that growth phase is going to be huge on that two week. Like, would you recommend like stepping it up from there? Cause that's normally what I would do. But if I can get away with just doing like a two liter starter off the bat, that saves me some work, right? Yeah, that would definitely save you some work. Um, yeah. If someone's been holding on to, to something for that long in the fridge, especially I would probably recommend maybe maybe stepping it up in that case usually the the two liter starter recommendation is based on the control that we are assuming is the number of pouches in one of our packs um okay. you could do like an equivalent amount you know 200 to 300 grams of that slurry into another two liters and and have that be your prop schedule is going to be about the equivalent in that front all right, cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Had a had a question come in through the chat to me. Um, Daryl had asked me, uh, does pitch rate affect the final gravity of beer? Yes, to a certain extent. So under pitching, certainly. So if you're under pitching. Um, there's a lot of increased risk of not having a beer finish out all the way and showing up as under attenuating and not making it to your final gravity. That said, over pitching does not always lead to over attenuation. So a lot of attenuation does come down to obviously your, your mash temperatures your recipe composition. There's only, the yeast can only consume as many sugars as is available to them. There are some conditions, um, you know, if you might have really warm or uncontrolled fermentation temperatures that might lead certain strains into consuming more sugars than they might normally would in a recommended range. Um, there are some circumstances that can contribute to that, but one way of thinking of it is that while under pitching can lead to under attenuation, over pitching will not always lead to over attenuation. You know, so if someone's trying to get a little bit more body in their beer or not ferment out as far and leaving some residual sugars, we don't typically recommend under pitching for that. That's something that we look at in terms of recipe design and uh, unfermentables and mash temps, if that's helpful. I know, I know Daryl's, <clears throat> pardon me, I know Daryl's listening, but uh, he's, uh, he's unable to speak up because he's at work. 
That's fine. So, <laughs> um, are there any other questions for Nina? I have one if I could jump in. Um, Nina, so obviously you mentioned that you relocated to Philadelphia to help open up the second shop. So I guess obviously things are going pretty well for Imperial. Um, on the homebrew side of things, um, I, I'm just wondering, because I think anecdotally I've been, I, I think I know and our club has, uh, we've had a quite a handful of new members join since the pandemic started. Um, I guess on the homebrew side pouches of your business, have you noticed like an increase in sales because maybe people are home more and taking up homebrewing as a hobby. So is that line of your business doing well? Uh, and is that kind of keeping pace or, or outpacing the growth for your commercial uh, brewery pitching? Yeah, I would say, I mean, honestly, a majority of our, our sales realm is in the commercial realm, but especially in the past year, the homebrew side of things has really kept pace. And particularly, I continue to work through the beginning of COVID, like last March was the most insane I had ever seen it for, for homebrew and retail side, because it was exactly that people were home more, um, it was time to jump into the new hobbies. And so we just had like this explosion of people purchasing pouches, it was quite a time to keep up with it. But since then, I think things have kind of evened out, but we're still really invested in the homebrew side and want to make sure that we're still cranking out new and fun and exciting strains. So yeah, we're, we're pretty stoked on how things are going on, on the homebrew side of things. Great. Um, I, I had another question come in, Nina. Um, Roy's mic isn't working. So uh, his ask was how long can harvested yeast be stored in refrigeration after harvest. I think you might have touched on this earlier, but I don't know if Roy yeah, was I can review. So. Yeah, no problem. Um, it, it's very variable. I would say the sooner you can use it, the better. We typically don't recommend going past a couple of weeks for most strains. Um, beyond that, it's just really hard to know unless we're looking at something under a scope or, or taking account. You can feel really confident as long as you're keeping it in a nice cool corner of that fridge where you're keeping it at temperatures between 33 and 38 degrees Fahrenheit is going to be ideal. Um, I think the hardiest strains for storage, if it's useful, are typically like American ale and Belgian strains where some of the weakest that hold up during storage are typically like German ale and um, loggers. Logger, logger strains really don't like to hang out in storage. They typically want to die off pretty quickly. So they're, they're the weakest link. Um, but if you need to be holding on to something into the many weeks or months, you can always use that slurry to build it back up with the starter. Or if you're going to use it, you can always have some backup yeast on hand in case things don't take off in a timely manner. Great, thanks. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, well, we have a number of folks here who are, who are big Belgians, Bel Belgian fans. So they're happy right to hear that. Right there with you. Yeah. <laughs> they're they're happy to hear that the Belgians are like, <laughs> you know, so that's good. Um, any other questions for Nina? I have a question. Um, I was just wondering about the whole idea of diacetyl. So I read something recently that said that you don't actually need to do a diacetyl rest if you don't actually create diacetyl. And I think it was reading an article by a Colorado brewery called Beer Stud Lager House or something like mm. that. And so mm -hmm. they recommend that they basically, they just start cold, stay cold and get colder. So they don't actually create those precursors to diacetyl. But 95% or 98% of the stuff I read is all about having to do this diacetyl rest. I've tried it. It doesn't seem to, and then done that like little thing where you shake it in the Nalgene bottle. I haven't had any issues. So I don't know what you think about that and whether or not, I don't know. I assume commercial brewers do a diacetyl rest, but maybe not all. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering. Yeah. I had actually caught that presentation. The one that you're referring to um, actually does that presentation quite a bit. And my ears kind of always perk up when she does talk about that particular, just not performing a diastole rest. And ultimately 
especially with lager fermentations, time is obviously really on their side, um, especially when it comes to flavor profile development of lagers. So I am unable to speak to the exact mechanisms that are really at play or not at play with their particular method. I'll admit I can't, I personally can't speak to that. Um, diastole rest is typically being performed for a, a couple of additional days past your terminal gravity. It generally is not hurting anything to give it a couple more, more days to just reabsorb some some of those compounds that are produced during fermentation and end up with a final product that's a lot cleaner. If you're running at least eight week long fermentations um, like they are at that particular brewery, then there's those are gonna be pretty damn clean beers and they taste really good if you've ever had them, they're delicious. <laughs> it's really good beer. Um, so yeah, it is a school of thought. We do typically recommend, especially on the homebrew scale where you might not have as intense temperature control for variables, performing a diacetyl rest is usually a good, good route to go. And you're doing something right if you're drinking your beer and you're like, this does not taste like diacetyl. <laughs> and does that uh, apply for uh, fermentation under pressure? Um, good question. We typically just go to saying like, give it a couple couple days past terminal, no matter what. Um, with fermentation under pressure, I know that that's typically to just reduce formation of ester profile. I am not sure about how that impacts um, diacetyl development. You know, I'll reach out, I'll talk to our tech team tomorrow and see if they have any thoughts on that. And I can include it in a follow-up email. Excellent. Thank I want to know. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. That's an interesting question because I, so I understood that you, part of it is you actually need to let that, some of those compounds. Yeah. Off. So if you're I would think that too. Kind of it, yeah. yeah. Thinking you need something to like, let it volatize. That's how I, how I'm thinking of it too, but I don't um, actually know. Another rabbit hole question again, this, uh, but it's, it's interesting to me because I'm thinking about yeast strains, particular to some some trends that we're playing with these days. So a lot of us are playing with late hopping and uh, you know aggressive dry hopping trends, and uh, you know there's a lot of talk about hop flash and uh, restarting fermentation and so on. Are there um, are there yeasts that are particularly friendly to this behavior? That you know that's what we're we're messing around with that we should keep an eye on? There's been some anecdotal conversations about that. I think mostly on the commercial side, I've seen some presentations where um, some breweries have talked about particular yeast strains that they're using in conjunction with certain hops that tend to have like a certain enzyme composition that might, might lead to, um, specifically in like active dry hop fermentations for haze retention. A lot of people are using something like A38 juice, which is pretty good for that. But um, I can't speak to any specific mechanisms of certain yeasts that are going to give particular results on that front. Sorry, I'm sitting, I'm sitting here typing away a, a message here, and I didn't realize that rain finished, and so did you, Nina. So my apologies. Any other? It's all good. Uh, any other questions for for Nina here? Um, you know, I, I want to echo uh, David's uh, David Larock statement from earlier that uh, we were really happy and and pleased that you were able to join us, and uh, very kind of Imperial to to reach out. And uh, and offer the presentation. Oh, I think oh, oh there's a couple here. Oh, oh, there we are. Yeah, yeah. Andrew's giving his little clapping. So little clapping hands. Nice. So <laughs> so we really appreciate it. Thank you very very much, Nina. Um, yeah, of course. And if any of you ever have any other questions, uh, I'll drop my email in the box here, and I'll also shoot it along when I follow up with you all. But feel free to reach out to us at any time, either me directly or through our website. Uh, we're always happy to answer questions any, anytime. 
Yeah, this has been awesome. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, thanks all. It's nice yeah. meeting you all and drinking a beer. So. Thank you. Yeah, I look forward to that 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 Philly that Philly production facility uh, really really yeah. coming online, right? So. Absolutely. All right, all. Well, have a good evening and hope to see y'all soon. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks, Nina. Thanks. Thanks.